Thank you very much for that very warm welcome. It's a huge pleasure to be here. It's been wonderful to meet so many fascinating scholars and students and to enjoy the treasures of your unbelievable library. And uh, I hope to go on doing that. And I'm very grateful to the Center for Advanced Studies, to the other institutions which have sponsored my visit, and above all, to Heather Miner, once student, now very warm friend, um, for arranging everything so wonderfully. Anyone who tries to persuade a normal modern audience, even an erudite audience at a hospitable place like Urbana, to examine the development of chronological scholarship probably faces an uphill battle. For the last two centuries at least, the very term chronology has seemed to demand the adjective mere, at least when it comes up among historians. And no wonder. The Huguenot scholar Joseph Scaliger, and Heather, if you would put on the light, we will have Scaliger up on the screen. The Huguenot scholar Joseph Scaliger, who worked in the decades around 1600, laid the technical foundations of this field, working in part on precedents built by others. And chronology, as he practiced it, dealt with subjects that now look scarily arcane. Scaliger plumbed the depths of ancient, medieval, and modern Western and Eastern calendar systems. He scrutinized the extant historians of the ancient world and collected the fragments that they quoted from historians no longer extant. And he reassembled all this material like a painstaking, even slightly fanatical maker of mosaics to recreate the dates of the central events of history. Now, in the 17th century, the central events of history started with the creation, then they went through the flood, the exodus, to the fall of Troy, the foundation of Rome, the birth of Jesus, not exactly events that most learned people nowadays would think you could necessarily fix to a, a year, much less a, a year, a month, and a day. Announce a lecture on chronology now in a major city, and you know what to expect. Swarms of rubber raincoated fanatics, their eyes rimmed with sleep buds, demanding to know your explanation for the 70 weeks of years in the book of Daniel, not to mention what you're going to do about the chip the CIA implanted in their brain some years ago. <laughs> Offer an article on chronology to a learned journal or a book on the subject to a university press and you'll hear editors screaming in the wonderful phrase of Tom Wolfe, like weenies on a barbecue. <laughs> well, that's a little unfair. When I handed in my 800 page printed page book on Scaliger and chronology, my editor looked at it and said, well, Mr. Grafton, they don't call Oxford the home of lost causes for nothing. <laughs> It's a spectacle to pain the few fanatics like me who take a systematic interest in the field. Yet the work that Scaliger and others did to build this armature of dates, to understand and use the years that ancient peoples had followed, was not only extraordinarily painstaking and technical, it was also interdisciplinary in a very specific sense. To do chronology, you had to combine the methods of classical philology, the interpretation of texts, and the methods of astronomy. For it's only datable astronomical events, like eclipses and new moons, which when mentioned by historians and other writers, enable us even now to fix the exact dates of historical events. And that's just what astronomers and scholars were doing in the second half of the 16th century, some of them even before Scaliger came on the scene. They found in ancient astronomy the most important date that no one has ever heard of, February 26th, 747 BCE. This is the date when King Nabonassar came to the throne of Babylon. And for reasons which we can't precisely specify, probably because Babylonian astronomy really began in the 8th century BCE, that is the date from which all ancient astronomers reckoned their observations and their computations. By dating the eclipses mentioned, say the three eclipses mentioned by Thucydides in his account of the Peloponnesian War, Astronomers and scholars were able to bring ancient history in the first millennium BCE back into crisp and precise focus, to turn it into something like a, a 
vast pyramid of precise information delicately balanced on the accession date of Nabonassar. And if you turn to the second image, and if we could have that, just to give you a sense of the scale and precision of this undertaking, here is a table. This is this magnificent, um, you've got to flip it 90 degrees, right? That's the trouble with chronology. You're always looking at things like this. This extraordinary table, um, put together by a, a Lutheran uh, chronologer, Paul Crusius, gives precise dates in years, months, and days from Nabonassar and other astronomical dates forwards to his own time in the 1570s, backwards to biblical time, all the way back to the creation. The historical dates that are organized on this magnificent construction are in almost every case exactly the date that you would find in the Oxford Classical Dictionary or another modern reference book. So to watch this process, as contemporaries did, was really like looking through a microscope and seeing the field suddenly come into focus as someone turned the dial. Ancient history, which had been a matter of vague guesses, suddenly became crisp and precise. Scaliger, though, did more than any of his predecessors. He was able to attack the strangest kinds of information and pull from them what we still recognize to be valid accounts of the past. My third image comes from his last great work on chronology, a, a, a nice 2,500 pages of Latin and Greek, which he entitled The Treasury of Chronology. The bottom half of the page is a list of rulers, starting with Nabonassar, which Scaliger discovered, which is a very strange looking list with very strange names, not attested in these forms in the Bible. He recognized what students of cuneiform records still do, that this was, could not be a forgery, it was too strange to be a forgery that this was, in fact, the real list of the rulers of Babylon, and then later on it becomes a list of rulers of Persia. This is the backbone of ancient history as we write it now. Scaliger discovered it, published it, and interpreted it in ways that we would still consider extraordinarily accurate and valid. No wonder, then, in a field which posed such high demands, in a field which exercised such excitement on those watching it take shape, that Scaliger became one of the great intellectuals of his time. He had passionate expert readers, like the great astronomer Johann Kepler, who wrote him long letters about the interpretation of this document and eventually came to agree with Scaliger on many of them. Even better, he had ferocious critics, both Protestant and Catholic scholars who denounced him at great length. And most remarkable of all, he was perhaps the first ever academic star. The University of Leiden, the most thrusting and innovative university in Europe, you think our universities grow. Leiden went from two students when it opened in 1575 to more than 1,000 by 1590. Hired Scaliger to study chronology. When he refused to teach, they gave him a full-time research appointment. When he balked at the ordinary salary he was offered, they paid him more money than the law professors. In fact, more money than the medicine professors. Then as now, no humanist ever received treatment like this. And for 15 years, Scaliger became the first research professor between the downfall of the Alexandrian Library and the rise of the MacArthur Foundation. So a chronologer was the Einstein or Crick of the late 16th century. More like Crick than Einstein because Scaliger, like Crick, was never seen in a modest mood. Uh, uh, someone who incorporated brilliance and learning when those were the values of the world of learning. If you just look at the fourth image from a Jesuit chronology from the late 17th century, here you get a sense of what chronology seemed to promise. You see, standing on your right, Cleo, the muse of history, all she has is a candle. She's looking a little depressed. On your left is chronology. She has the sun and the moon. They are part of her. Astronomy is what she has. And with that, she is sending a rainbow to illuminate the lilies of the past, more glorious than Solomon in all his glory. This is the kind of prestige that invested chronology in its heyday. Well, rhetoric, it's been said, is one of the big obstacles that prevents us from really understanding our ancestors. We have forgotten the technical canons of classical rhetoric. Uh, 
We don't remember or understand why at Gettysburg, the two-hour speech by Edward Everett, an immense and hideously empty web of rolling periods with no content, was what enchanted the newspaper reporters while the few short sentences spoken by one President Lincoln went almost without notice. Rhetoric is one bar, technical chronology in its own way stands between us and our scholarly forebears. For the most part, we can look dates up nowadays in reference books like one of my favorites, Eclipses for Humanists, which stands <laughs> a work which I use every day. But to understand what chronology meant in the 16th and 17th centuries, you need to imagine it as a scene of lively activity, of construction, reconstruction, when now it's become a kind of sec sunken city. The waters of oblivion have closed over its ruined towers. So let me try today to bring this strange study back to life for you a little bit. Well, what was chronology? In the first instance, it was a simple structure of dates that all educated people shared and believed was absolutely solid. In 1485, the Portuguese explorer Diogo Cao erected the Cape Cross Monument in what's now Namibia. He and his men had long since passed out of the Ptolemaic world, world map. They had no idea where they were but they knew when they had arrived at this place, which they couldn't name. And they erected the cross with a commemorative message noting that they had reached this place on the coast of Africa in the year of the world, 6,685. To arrive at this, they used a very simple method. Following the Greek translation of the Old Testament, they believed that the world was created 5,200 years before the incarnation of the Savior. Add that sum to the 1,485 years that, they, that they, had, they lived after the Savior, and you knew exactly when in the history of salvation you were living. So world history was seen as something fixed, governed by the authoritative text of the Bible, the kind of knowledge that you could set in stone. Geography had a similar status in the 15th and 16th centuries. It had been canonized by the great ancient scientist Ptolemy in his magnificent Atlas, one of the most popular books of the 15th and 16th centuries, uh, which offered both local maps and a magnificent map of the whole uh, inhabited world. Let's just have that next if we could. This is a, here's a version of the map of the world that Ptolemy gave. It comes from a world chronicle, Hartmann Schadel's Nuremberg Chronicle. And as you see, what Schadel has done very cleverly is to correlate the three continents that Ptolemy represented, Asia, Europe, and Africa, to the three sons of Noah. So Japheth is off on the left. He's the, he's the ancestor of the Europeans. Shem is the ancestor of the Asians. Cain is going to be the ancestor of the Africans. Biblical and classical geography all fitting together in a single powerful structure. Well, we all know what happened to that structure. In the course of the 15th and 16th centuries, as explorers discovered the path around Africa to the south and found that the Indian Ocean was open, and then, of course, discovered the new continents to the west, this geography, this whole structure was destroyed. And as the structure fell, terrifying new questions rose. Where did the people in the Americas come from? They didn't have a son of Noah. So who were they? Were they human at all? Some people denied it. Were they the Chinese who had crossed by a land bridge, as some observers guessed? Or were they Laps who had managed to cross across the ice of the Arctic Ocean? Theor many theories circulated. Was it possible that the ancients had known these people? Could Peru, for example, with its mines of precious metal, have been the Ophir from which Solomon's ships brought precious metals in the Old Testament? Theories collided, arguments were raised against arguments, and by the 1570s, Gerardus Mercator expressed a common opinion when he said, we only study ancient geography now for historical purposes. It's fun to see how Ptolemy laid out the world. We understand the surface of the world in a completely different way. By contrast, the history of chronology is much more sharply contested 
much less subject to any kind of clear and visible revolution. And I, I originally thought I might write the history of the death of biblical time in the 17th century, except biblical time never dies. Biblical time is like the uh, murderer in Cape Fear. You think you've got rid of him, but he's actually hanging on under the car, and when you get to your beach house, he comes out again. And so Spinoza and others thought they had destroyed biblical time in the 17th century, but now it's back in the Grand Canyon, where the guides can no longer give you the geological age of the canyon because they have to tell you it's 6,000 years old. So chronology, in other words, though always linked with geography in our period and often practiced by the same people, requiring the same kinds of technical skills, didn't undergo a single lucid coherent revolution of the sort that geography demonstrably did. So what was chronology's history? Well, let's start with the next image. Here is the favorite chronology of the 15th and early 16th century. It's the fasciculus temporum, the bundle of chronology of a Carthusian monk called Werner Rolovink. And as you can see, it's an extremely clever and, uh, and, and quite complex arrangement of lines and circles. The circles have the names of biblical characters. The lines carry time forward and back. In the middle of the, in the center of the page from right to left, the top line carries history forward from the creation. The back, the underline carries history backward from the incarnation. This is the first printed use of years BC. Um, already here being used in the 15th century. It's a compact chronology, neat and tidy. On the left, you can see the Tower of Babel in a very conventional image. Uh, on the right, the city of Nineveh. And in fact, most of what he's doing here comes right out of the biblical scholarship and chronology of the Middle Ages. As early as the 12th century, Parisian scholars had laid out the history of the Old Testament, usually on magnificent scrolls made out of parchment with series of circles and lines to indicate the descents of the biblical patriarchs down to Jesus and beyond. Rolovink crafted this into a printed text, put it on normal pages, and added the history of the ancient world, which the medieval chronicles had usually omitted. So it's more comprehensive. But it is lucid, it is coherent, it's relatively brief, it's only about 50 pages long. And it doesn't recognize any problems. Chronology in the same period when geography is already beginning to fall apart and the Portuguese are already passing the Cape of Good Hope, chronology doesn't recognize that there are any serious difficulties. There are ancient difficulties in chronology. If we could have the, the next slide. This, uh, this table illustrates one. There are two ancient versions of the Old Testament besides the Latin Vulgate of the medieval church. The Hebrew Bible, still used by Jews, and the Greek translation of the Bible, which was also done by Greek-speaking Jews, the Reformed Jews of the ancient world, you could say. And these two Bibles differ on a great many points, and one of them is chronology. If you look at the table in front of you, you'll see Adam is born at the same time in each one, but Seth, who we've cut this off in the left, I'm sorry. Seth is born in the left, which is the Hebrew Bible, when Adam's 130. He's born in the right when Adam is 230. Enoch is born when Adam is, four, is, is 235. Enoch is born in the, in the Greek when he's 435. So the distance between the creation and the flood is several hundred years longer in the Greek Bible than it is in the Hebrew Bible. The Greek Bible was actually often seen as more authoritative than the, Hebrew, than the Hebrew text. It was thought Jews might have changed the Hebrew text in order to fool the Christians, though there's no evidence that this ever happened. So what did you do about this basic disagreement? Well, if you were Werner Rolovink, you figured out a way of counting backwards from the incarnation. And you simply said, it's not a problem. If you're following the Hebrew text, you count backward 4,000 years. If you're following the Greek text, you count back 5,200 years. And at the end of time, God will tell us which of these chronologies is right. <laughs> so we, you know, there was no serious problem that chronology acknowledged in the way that there, there were serious problems in geography. Why then did chronology have such an absorbing interest? <laughs> 
Well, one set of factors, I think, has to do with just a change in the sense of time, which is pervasive in 15th and 16th century culture. This is a world in which time and devices for measuring time exercised an enormous, uh, enormous fascination. Immense spectacular escapement clocks rang the hours in city squares and cathedrals. This is the old Strasbourg Cathedral clock. Many of you will have seen the newer one redone in the 18th century. Clocks which would remind you not just that time was passing, but that death was imminent for a series of automata, including the days of the week, old father time and death with his sickle would, would move in a circle above the clock face every time the hour struck. These clocks would tell you the positions of the planets, the dates of Easter and other feasts, and above all, they would remind you that time was passing. Smaller versions, but equally complex, adorned every mantelpiece in the Holy Roman Empire, ringing the hours. And splendid as these were, these timekeeping devices were nothing but the material embodiment of a new consciousness of time, one that seems to have come into being in the advanced mercantile cities of Italy and Flanders, but also in monasteries in the 13th and 14th centuries. And in fact, it's in monasteries that the first of these big clocks are used, not to drive merchants and craftsmen to their work, but to drive the monks to their prayers in the middle of the night. Long before there were any Protestants or many chronologers, a memorable character in Leon Battista Alberti's dialogues on the family was reminding his younger relatives that you must always watch the time and telling, him, telling them that he kept a diary and never went to bed until he had finished the day's business. Even if he had to miss a night's sleep, he would pay a debt that was due or receive a payment that was due because you must always watch the time. The 16th century, as Max Engemar has shown in a recent book, became a great age of diaries. And diary keeping, especially when combined with Protestant guilt, made people <laughs> conscious of the passage of time in ways that you just don't see in the Middle Ages. My favorite ex instance of this is another great Huguenot scholar, Isaac Casaubon, who kept a very detailed diary in Latin of what he did every day. A characteristic entry begins, I rose at five, alas, how late. <laughs> went, and went into my study to work. Again and again, he records the visits of friends who waste his time. Amici in amici, my friends are my enemies. They won't let me work. They won't let me read my 50 folio pages of Greek a day. So there's a tremendous sense of time as something uniform, measurable, determined by the stars, accessible to human industry, and playing powerful roles in human affairs, a sense that finds expression in multiple forms, from the image of opportunity, Ocasio, as having a forelock but the back of her head bald, so if you don't grab quickly, she's gone and your hand simply slides away, to the wonderful speech of Richard II, I've wasted time and now doth time waste me. No wonder then that chronologies filled bookshelves. No wonder that as Joseph Scaliger complained, every book fair in Frankfurt brought forth a new crop of chronologies. No wonder that the ingenuity of chronologers produced not just book length introductions to time, but wall hanging chronologies, which are simply too complex to show you. And even if I could have the next one, my favorite of all chronologies, this chronology machine in which you could, by holding the two handles at the bottom, turn the scroll and make all of history pass before you. It, it, it's absolutely a, a magnificent device from the early 18th century, beautifully preserved. There are several of these in American libraries. So time mattered, time worried people, time fascinated them. The study of time was a hallmark of civilization. Everyone agreed that civilized peoples understood the importance of time. The famous ambassador to Turkey, Ogier Gizlan de Buzbek, mocked the Turks because he said, they have no sense of time. They'll tell you that Job was King Solomon's chamberlain and Alexander the Great was King Solomon's cavalry general. By contrast, when Michel de Montaigne read about the Aztecs, he noted they were clearly civilized over there because they had a sophisticated calendar. No wonder that Christian experts raged and railed 
when they found that the Christian calendar no longer worked, that Easter was actually falling on the wrong days. No wonder that even Protestants were often relieved after Gregory reformed the calendar in the 1580s. My favorite expression of this view comes from one of the most mild-mannered of chronologers, Philip Melanchthon, creator of the German gymnasium tradition and the Protestant university. One night at dinner in the university, someone mocked chronology and said, why do we need chronology? The peasants on my farms know when it's time to sow and when it's time to reap, and they don't have chronology. Melanchthon, with all the uh, politeness that German professors are famous for, said, that was unworthy of a doctor. Someone should shit a turd into your doctor's hat and put it back on your head. <laughs> so time was definitely part of academic civilization. And if time mattered to every learned person, historic time mattered more than most other aspects of time. For ancient books still contained the keys to the kingdom of knowledge, and only a mastery of the mysteries of historical time could enable scholars to read the ancient books sensibly, to understand the connections between, for example, the Greek historians Herodotus and Thucydides, and the Bible, all of them touching on the history of the Persians, but from such different perspectives, or the history of the Egyptians. Now, one point that my Renaissance chronologers didn't often mention because it was obvious to them and that the few modern scholars who've concerned themselves with this field have tended not to pay due attention to was that chronology of this kind, this comparative cosmopolitan field, was actually an ancient rather than a modern creation. Babylonians kept chronological records. Greeks, especially in the Hellenistic period, drew up chronological tables. And in the Christian world of the third and fourth centuries, Christian scholars brought together a vast amount of information in a form which seems to have been completely novel in the world of the book. And the, the final form of chronology in the ancient world, the form which is then transmitted into the Latin world from the Greek and throughout the Middle Ages, is that of Eusebius, who finished his chronicle around 300 or a little after in the Christian era. Eusebius, and if we could just have the next um, transparency, you'll see one sample of his work, had the brilliant idea of laying out all of time from the flood to his own day in parallel columns. For each of the important kingdoms or peoples, he gave a column, and the columns would wax and wane as the kingdoms waxed and waned. You'd see the Assyrians and the Babylonians rise, and you'd see them go along, and you'd see them fall. You could, you could coordinate events. Here in this page, you find that you have Thales of Miletus, one of the founders of Greek philosophy, and just after him, the prophet Jeremiah. So you learn by reading Eusebius to coordinate the history of the Jews and then of the Christians with the, with the history of the ancients. Eusebius laid out no fewer than 19 tables, 19 different peoples. They rise. First the Assyrians, then the Babylonians, then the Medes, then the Persians, then the Macedonians, and then they all begin to funnel down, first into the Macedonian and then into the Roman column until there's nothing left but Rome and Israel, and then after the Jewish war of the first century, there's nothing left but Rome. It's an extraordinary accomplishment. It involved coordinating a vast amount of information. It involved coordinating scribes to do this very complicated layout. And its result was to make history not simply extremely cosmopolitan and comparative, but also visually meaningful. What you saw as you worked through Eusebius's chronology was the hand of providence at work raising kingdoms up and then lowering them down until all of history funneled into a unified Roman world in time for Jesus to arrive and the world to be unified by the Christian message. It's an extraordinary accomplishment, not only of intellectual capacity and scholarly precision, but also of graphic ingenuity. I like to compare it, if you go to the next slide, to Charles Minard's wonderful image of Napoleon's invasion of Russia, a great 19th century graphic image. So you follow this, you see the Napoleonic army, this very wide stream entering Russia.
and you can follow the graph, which graphs the, char the progress of the army against time and temperature as it penetrates all the way into Russia and then as it begins to retreat. And you have this extraordinary story. You start with 422,000 troops and you end with 10,000 coming out at the, very, at the very end on the bottom. A magnificent uh, display of information in graphic form. What Eusebius did, though simpler, was also a magnificent display of graphic information in coherent form. And this is one of the services that chronology did that made it such a powerful and fascinating discipline. It showed you the hand of God acting in history. And this is also one of the purposes of chronology in the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries. If you just turn to the next image, here you see a chronology based on the statue which Daniel describes and explains in the second chapter of the biblical book of Daniel. You'll remember that he tells the king that he has dreamed of a statue with a head of gold, shoulders of silver, and uh, hips of brass, and, uh, and, and legs of iron and mud, and that each of these parts of the statue stands for one of the four empires that are going to rule history and that finally a great stone comes and smashes the image. In Christian interpretation, this of course is always the end of time coming with the, re with the second coming of the Messiah. This is a late 17th century chronology textbook in the form of an image of Daniel's statue with the four empires, Assyrian, Medo-Persian, uh, Macedonian, and finally the Roman. You'll notice that wonderfully the Roman Empire separates out with the Western Roman Empire taking one leg and the Byzantine Empire taking the other. It's, a, again, a magnificent visual hieroglyph of the way that the course of history has gone in the past, and it mirrors other powerful visual images more than one German prince had a statue built with this history inscribed on it and his own face on the statue as if to remind himself that he should at least act like an eschatological prince, a great Christian prince at the end of time. If you turn to the next page, here, 70 years before the print was made from a classroom in Nuremberg, you see a student taking down the same drawing, evidence of the popularity and durability of this schema. You can also see that the poor student didn't quite get the thing about the big rock, which is sort of a peninsula in the bottom left. Um, then as now, you never want to think too hard about the final exams that you read. Well, what you see here, in other words, is a discipline which was powerfully interdisciplinary which spoke on the basis of both deep historical and philological knowledge and of serious astronomical evidence which combined humanities and science already threatening to separate, which was a hallmark of civilized life and which in one of its most popular forms taught that fundamental lesson that time was hurrying on but the hand of providence was making it hurry and every however disorderly life and events might seem, a providential order would reassert itself by the end of time. And looking backwards, one would see that everything had been for the best. I think that helps to understand why chronology mattered so much, why a Scaliger could have a, a prestige that now you'd look in vain for a modern humanist who could have the kind of standing that he did. And yet, by 1700, this whole magnificent set of structures was in ruins. By 1700, most European scholars had given up on the possibility of arriving at consensus about the relation between biblical and classical history. Sir Isaac Newton was famously abridging all of history by several hundred years in order to prove that Greek civilization started long after Hebrew civilization. Newton, the, the greatest of scientists, was an absolutely terrible chronologer. Um, and bizarrely enough, a group of very distinguished Russian scientists are replicating his achievement now and arguing in great detail that the entire structure of ancient history as we understand it is a fraud perpetrated to make Russia look like a newer state than Greece and Rome. And these are very distinguished Russian physicists and astrophysicists. So, as I say, you never kill these bad ideas. They always come back. More important than Newton in this field 
John Battista Vico, in his New Science, was arguing powerfully that chronology was in the end a futile dream, that, it, that each ancient people had boasted as loudly as it could of its antiquity, that one simply couldn't use any of this material to construct a true and profound history, and that instead one must construct a conjectural history of the world based on knowledge of human nature, based on, and rather than attempting to provide the kind of detailed carapace of dates and events that chronologers had sought to provide. Voltaire, always somebody who could put the common wisdom better than anyone else, said, chronology, what's chronology? It's the sterile science of dates and facts which wastes its time telling you in some, what year some totally insignificant person was born or died. That was the epitaph for the kind of chronology that people like Scaliger had practiced. How did this happen? Well, in the end, it's that saddest of stories, as T.H. Huxley said, when a magnificent theory collides with a fact that it absolutely can't accommodate. Chronology in the course of the 17th century collided with facts that it simply could not accommodate within its capacious traditional structure. And scholars for a long time have pointed to China as being the great fact that destroyed traditional chronology. If we could have the, the next um, image. In the 1640s and 50s, the Jesuit Martino Martini, cartographer, astronomer, and scholar who produced the first Western atlas of China to be printed, also published in the West the first chronology of China based on Chinese sources. Martini had tremendous respect for Chinese scholarship. He was himself, like uh, the very best of the Jesuit missionaries, a very good Chinese scholar. He collected many chronicles. And what he felt that he found in them were records of the ancient Chinese kings, which were detailed, which were confirmed by dated astronomical observations, exactly what Western, uh, Western chronologers saw as the criterion of truthfulness in, in chronology, and which unfortunately started before the universal flood. <laughs> Martini didn't want to believe that history had started before the flood. He was a good Jesuit but Martini couldn't suppress evidence that he believed was solid, for he was also a good scholar by the terms of the time. And so he came back to Europe and published his work, not in one of the zones of Europe subject to the censorship of the Catholic Church, but in Amsterdam, um, where he wasn't subject to any kind of censorship. And this Chinese evidence is often cited in the course of the seven, later 17th and 18th century as the straw that broke the back of the chronological camel. Voltaire and others talk gleefully about the antiquity of the Chinese, which earlier scholars hadn't recognized. In fact, it's a nice story. It's, it's got the right kind of moral. Here you have these bookish scholars fiddling with their records. Along comes a Jesuit man of action who goes outside the Hortus Conclusus of the West. He goes to China, he finds new information. It's rather like the story of geography. The only problem is that's much simpler than what actually happened. And I'll ask you just to bear with me for a few more minutes as I give the real story of this particular bit of the breakdown of chronology. Martini didn't go to China and learn to his shock that there had been kingdoms before the flood. He went to China looking for kingdoms before the flood. The reason for that was very simple. He was a very well-trained Jesuit, a brilliant young man who'd been sent to the Collegio Romano, the greatest of Jesuit educational institutions. And there he had studied, if we could have the next image, with the most brilliant of Jesuit mathematicians and scholars, Athanasius Kircher. He had frequented Athanasius Kircher's apartment in the Collegio Romano. Now, the Collegio Romano is now a, a high school in Rome, a very good high school. And a few years ago, this apartment was rediscovered. Uh, and, and the only thing you need to know about it is that it's only about seven and a half feet high. Um, <laughs> It really did have the obelisks. These were Kircher's obelisk models, uh, and they were about as large as their show. They were about seven feet high. Um, they've all been brought out and exhibited. It's only the little people that you should ignore. <laughs> 
Kircher's apartment, where Martini studied, was a Kunst und Wunderkammer, a Renaissance museum, where you could see the shin bone of one of the biblical patriarchs, um, look at evidence about the new astronomy of Copernicus, you can see it there on the ceiling, look through a telescope, and also hear about history. And Kircher's sense of history was very particular. Kircher believed, long before Martini went to China, that he knew where history had started, and it had started before the flood in Egypt, the land of these great obelisks, some of which he thought might actually have been made before the flood itself. Kircher believed that Egypt was the oldest human civilization, that it had been ruled by priests, masters of magic and science and learning, that they had encoded their philosophy on the obelisks, and this was the doctrine that he imparted to his partner in crime, John, Be John Lorenzo Bernini, as they created with obelisks two of the most magnificent public spaces in the world, the Piazza Navona in Rome and the Piazza in front of Santa Maria Sopra Minerva. These were fairly radical views. Dominicans, as you know, were the favorite inquisitors, the Dominicanes, dogs of the Lord. And when Kircher and Bernini put up an obelisk with Egyptian moral philosophy on top of an elephant in front of Santa Maria Sopra Minerva, it was very near the Dominican house. So Bernini pointed the elephant's bottom at the Dominicans <laughs> as evidence of what he thought of them and had the, the elephant's trunk do the closest thing an elephant trunk can do to this gesture, already very well understood in Italy. So, Martini learned from Kircher that Egypt had somehow existed before the flood and that its pyramids and obelisks had carried knowledge of that early history through the great transformation of the world which the flood had brought about. It was therefore no surprise to Martini that the Chinese also had records of what had happened before the flood because he and Kircher both thought the Chinese were also Egyptians. <laughs> After all, they both had hieroglyphic languages. And he merely thought one group had stayed in Egypt and the other group had migrated after the flood to China. What we see here, in other words, is less the discovery of this spectacular new fact coming in from outside Europe than Europeans prepared by objects and traditions that they knew to begin tearing down the structure which looked so solid. And in fact, Kircher had reason to think that Egypt was older than it was supposed to be. And that reason came from the great Protestant chronologer, Joseph Scaliger, the man who made his name as the builder of the best, most rigorous, most lucid chronology, was also the real destroyer of the whole enterprise. In his chronicle, Eusebius quotes lots of writers that we don't have including Barossus, the historian of ancient Chaldea, and Manetho, the historian of ancient Egypt. These were real writers who wrote histories of their lands in Greek after Alexander the Great conquered them, trying to revenge in the realm of the archive the defeats they'd suffered on the actual battlefield. We don't have their books, but there were these tempting fragments. Early, well, sorry, late in the 15th century, the most creative of all Renaissance chronologers Giovanni Nanni, or Annius of Viterbo, published these fragments, not admitting that he'd actually written them as well, inspired by the bits that were actually quoted, and surrounded them with a magnificent commentary in which he traced all of history back to the wonders of ancient Egypt. He showed that the Borgia, who included his patrons, were directly descended from Isis and Osiris. He showed that the first place to be cultivated after the flood was not Armenia or distant Asia, but actually Rome. This was perfectly easy to understand. The highest hill in Rome is the Janiculo, the hill of Janus. Now, Janus is quite clearly the same word as the Hebrew word for wine, yayin. And Noah, of course, as we all know, is the inventor of wine after the flood. So the Janiculo, the hill of Janus, was actually the hill where Noah put in with the ark after the flood, the hill which had the first vines, where Noah is exposed by his evil son when he's drunk. 
And it's from the Janicolo that civilization spreads, in the first instance to Viterbo, Aeneas' own hometown, which of course then became the center of Etruscan civilization. It's a wonderful history of the world. It tells you lots of things you'd want to know. Did you ever wonder whether, where the Lombards came from? Well, they came, as you can see from the modern row, from two gentlemen called Bardas and Longo, who between them produced the Longobards. Did you ever wonder where the Druids came from? Well, they came from Druides, whose son is Celtes, from whom, of course, the Celts were descended. It's a magnificent book. It's wild, it's lurid, it is self-evidently silly. Um, Beatus Renanus, one of the great Renaissance scholars, said of the texts and the commentary, well, one of these guys is milking a he-goat and the other one's holding out a sieve to catch the milk. And yet, it was a bestseller. It outsold Herodotus, it outsold Thucydides, it outsold Livy because Aeneas brilliantly showed that all of the modern nations of Europe could trace their genealogies back to Troy and beyond Troy, back to ancient Egypt. Well, after Aeneas wrote, every chronologer worth his salt wanted to know more about Manetho. Some of them wanted to believe in Aeneas' Manetho. Others, like Scaliger, wanted to find the real author if they possibly could. In 1602, Scaliger found the real Manetho reading a Byzantine chronicle which had been sent him by his friend Kasaubin from Paris, he struck the real Manetho's lists of Egyptian dynasties, which are, like the Babylonian list that I started with, still our lists of Egyptian dynasties. If you ever go to the Egyptological Museum in Turin and see the great Turin papyrus of Egyptian dynasties, it matches pretty well the Greek dynasty lists of Manetho. There was only one problem with Manetho's list. It started before the flood. In fact, it started before the creation. <laughs> now, Scaliger was a firm believing Protestant who thought that the Bible was an absolute history of humanity, but he, like Martini, was a good scholar. What do you do when you find a list? Well, his first reaction, which he records in his manuscripts, is to say this is a fake. His second reaction was to scratch that out and say, no, this isn't a fake. This is too strange to be a fake. So he simply printed it and said, I don't know what to do with this, but it seems to be the real Manetho, and it seems to start before the flood. Indeed, it seems to start before the creation. So what we're going to do is just assume some extra historical time, okay, everybody? We're going to call this postulated time or proleptic time, and we're just going to start way back, and that's fine, I'm just doing the history of 8,000 years, according to the Pagans, as he told his students, not mentioning that you couldn't do the history of more than 5,500 5, years if you believed in the biblical account of history. Kircher learned from Scaliger. The Jesuit in Rome learned from the Calvinist in Leiden to believe that the best historical sources we had showed that Egypt had, lived, Egypt had existed before the flood. The final kicker in the story is that the man who preserved Manetho was actually Eusebius himself. Eusebius, who had created that wonderful tabular structure of Christian history from the flood to his own time, also had Manetho's history of Egypt and Barossus' history of Chaldea, and he had no idea what to do with them. He didn't know how to slot them into a chronology, he didn't know how to make sense of them. He didn't even know whether he thought the Greek or Hebrew text of the Old Testament was the more valid for chronological purposes. So what he did was to write what is in some ways the first great footnote ever written. He made his table of world history book two, and he made a book one in which he put all the materials it was drawn from, including these wild texts, and he left matters there. St. Jerome, who translated Eusebius into Latin, simply omitted the footnote and translated the table. So all of this material was forgotten until Scaliger came along, inspired by a forger, to look for the real Manetho. Now, this is, I think it's clear, a less elegant but more historical story than the one that we used to tell. Not a simple story of the collision between new fact and old theory, but something much more complicated.
when an explosion that takes place not at the border of the garden of chronology, but right in the center of the garden as dynamite that Eusebius had packed away centuries before is suddenly lit and exploded to everybody's astonishment. It's a very different story from the story of geography. Now, just to finish off, I'm sure at this point you're ready to say, as my children used to say, that's not a proper story. Just three ways in which this story played itself out. The first has to do with the changing status of the Bible. In America, it's easy to forget that biblical literalism is a new idea. There are very few biblical literalists in Christian antiquity or the Middle Ages. Exegetes knew better than that. But the criterion of truth for the Reformation was the Bible. And what Luther meant by that, of course, was the letters of St. Paul. But by the end of the 16th century, as Protestant and Catholic theologians clashed, Protestants tended to be much more defensive about the Bible than Luther had been. They began, in fact, by the early 17th century to argue that the Bible was literally inspired, a Protestant doctrine found among both Lutherans and Calvinists, that not only every word of the Greek New Testament, but every word of the Hebrew Old Testament was inspired and dictated by God. Not just every letter, but every vowel point and every accent in the Hebrew. Catholics, in response, became more biblicist than they had been. Medieval Catholic exegetes, like Rolovink, had no problem with the idea that the Bible might be incomplete or problematic. But as Galileo found out in the 1630s, 17th century Catholic exegetes also took a more tender view towards biblical authority than their medieval predecessors had done. So part of the reason that this story takes place doesn't have to do so much with chronologers themselves as with the changing world of belief about authoritative texts within which they practiced. And I have the feeling when I read Scaliger himself, especially his table talk, the remarks that his students took down, that he was very oppressed by this, that he realized that things that he had been able to say openly when he was young could no longer be said openly in, the, in his old age. A second point has to do with the central position of chronology in a world of learning which aspired to encyclopedism. The erudite men of the early 17th century really wanted to construct encyclopedic systems that drew on all forms of learning, that brought all of knowledge together. And they tried to find points at which Protestants and Catholics, Lutherans and Calvinists could actually forge agreement on this. Chronology looked like a prime field for this kind of intellectual consensus building, for further refinement. And I think it was a kind of Greenland. It drew them in to their own destruction. The harder they worked, the more they found themselves like sorcerer's apprentices, calling more and more problems into existence which they wouldn't, couldn't cope with. And finally, there was the fact that in the mid-17th century, that age of religious turmoil of the apocalyptic years of the later years of the Thirty Years' War, of the English Revolution or Civil War as we used to call it, chronology moves culturally. It remains a learned discipline, but it also becomes a popular subject. It's discussed in pamphlets. It's argued about in alehouses, especially apocalyptic chronology. The issues that scholars could discuss with some measure at times of sophistication and tolerance became more frightening, more divisive, more insoluble as they migrated culturally from Latin to the vernacular, from great learned folios to broadsheets and little duodecimo pamphlets to which anybody had access. The study that I'm writing now is going to try to trace all of these stories, the story of biblical chronology and the, the rise of literalism in the 17th century, as well as that of the attack on literalism, the story of this larger world of learning, and finally, the story of what happens when learning escapes the control of the learned and becomes accessible to people who haven't been taught to be prudent. So that's, the, that's a very short sketch of what I'm afraid is going to be another long and terrifying book. What I hope it will show, and what I hope I've shown very briefly today, is that chronology is probably a lost cause now. I think I can say without fear of contradiction that chronology will never again be a fashionable subject. 
There will never again be a chronologer who is admired across the universities of Europe and the United States. But I would have also suggested that in its day, it was both an ancient tradition and a cutting edge interdisciplinary field of inquiry, and that it attracted extraordinary practitioners, giants who sorted the rubble of biblical and classical, ancient and medieval, Western and Eastern traditions, built strange structures from them, and in doing so, tested to their limits and beyond the scholarly and scientific tools which they created. It's a complicated story, it's an all too human story, and to me it's fascinating for one reason above all. It's easy to understand how geography fell apart, it really did fall apart when it had to confront facts that it couldn't accommodate. Chronology is the much more complex question of a discipline that to some extent undermined and to some extent renewed itself from within, even as it had to confront new challenges from without. Writing that history in a way that does justice to both the internal development and the external circumstances of the field is going to be an enormous challenge. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. Yeah, just the, the craft Thank you very much, Tony, for that wonderful uh, talk. If you have any questions, I'm sure Professor Grafton would be more than happy to entertain them. And then we're also going to have a reception afterwards, too. Yeah. Thank you. So just for anyone who couldn't hear, is there a genuine connection between the drama of time as a force in human affairs, the sense that time is passing, that one must somehow struggle against or work with time, and the particular development of chronological scholarship? And my belief is that, in fact, there is a, there is a clear connection, that the two things are, are related. For one thing, one of the forms of chronological scholarship in this period, one that I didn't talk about today, but which is quite well developed, seeks to tell you not the long term of time, but the calendar dates of great events. There is a massive investment of scholarship in working out when during the year, for example, Troy fell, when during the year the various Roman disasters like the Dies Aliae were, and these are then incorporated in calendars. The closest equivalent I've ever seen are the McDonald's menus that tell you what day, what happened on each day of the month. And the very people who become the first diary keepers, like Kasaubin, use these diaries to record their experiences. So the, the diary in which you record your sense of what you're doing day by day actually connects you back to Roman history, to Greek history, to Hebrew history in a very powerful and direct way. Um, one of the keepers of such a diary, by the way, was Montaigne. Um, who we, we still have a fragmentary version of the printed diary in which he entered, in which he entered various things, and it, it is one of these printed diaries with deep historical background. So I think if, if one looks at that, and if one looks at the, you know, the, the way in which these two things rise, this passion for precise systems of dating and the passion for dating the life of the town by the clock, they really are absolutely simultaneous. I don't think, I mean, I've worried of, about whether this was importing a 21st or 20th century category, but I don't think so. I think that my protagonists would have agreed that these were connected phenomena.
and would have said, indeed, that the big Strasbourg clock was a chronological clock. It told you about cycles that ruled history. Yeah? Did the Chinese have any thoughts about the end of time? Did the Chinese have thoughts about the end of time? The Chinese, so far as I know, were not worried about the end of time. They were mostly very bemused by these Westerners who um, basically they thought were very impudent in trying to fold them into a world history and say that they were Egyptian when the Chinese knew perfectly well that they had been where they were for a very long time. Uh, there's a wonderful Chinese scholar in Berlin who's worked on the 17th and 18th century Chinese responses to these Western ideas because Jesuits bring some of them to China and talk about, China, talk about them with Chinese scholars. And it's not that they're angry, it's just that they're really kind of bemused at these silly Westerners. You know, why are they worried about such recent dates anyhow? You know, they must be real parvenu to have you know, so, such a modest historical tradition. So that's their, that's their main response. Yeah? Was there a challenge to the world of chronology from Arabic writing, as Islamic writing? The answer is there should have been, but they didn't have the right books in the West. The greatest work of ethnography that I've ever read before modern times is the India of al-Biruni, a Central Asian writer writing in Arabic. Um, and it's the most magnificent ethnography of a deeply complex other civilization. He learned Sanskrit, he talked to lots of people at every social level. He begins wonderfully by saying, you know, it's really hard to understand another civilization. When I would visit my Indian friends, they would sell, tell their children, you know, go to bed or we'll send Al-Biruni after you. Um, you know, as if I was some sort of a monster. And then, you know, when I came home, I realized I could tell my children, you know, go to bed or I'll get one of our Indian friends to come after you. Well, Al-Biruni, because he could read Sanskrit, read the Indian chronologies, which were these very, very deep, long cycles that are part of Indian astronomy and chronology, um, which go back far beyond any Christian or Jewish chronicle. And unfortunately, because I'd have loved to see what my people would have done with him, he's not known in the West until the 19th century. And in fact, Westerners are reading Sanskrit before they read his account of this. So they encounter the Indian long deep time in the late 18th century independently. That would have been an absolutely fascinating encounter, but so far as I can find out, it doesn't happen. There is a little bit of Indian chronology in the West, which they don't know what to do with. In the Middle Ages, there is the great astronomical tables are called the Alphonsine tables done by King Alfonso of Castile and in the 13th century. And they have a date for the flood, which is about 5000 BC. And their creation date is even earlier than that. And in the Renaissance, certain people say, what is this flood date? Why is it so early? The answer is that's actually the Indian date of the Kali Yuga. It's the, it's the date of the a change of cycle into the most recent cycle in Indian astronomy, which was known to Persians who were known to the Arabs, but nobody in the West really knows what to do with that. So it's only those, that kind of drib and, and drab. They use lots of Arabic material, but the Arabic material they have is mostly astrological history, which um, like uh, Masha Allah, which is actually Jewish, but written in Arabic, and that, that kind of fits their, their parameters all too well. Yeah. and uh, the evidence that showed that technology began before, uh, began even before the creation. Because, so th because this seems to be, uh, this seems to be implying that, uh, that at the time that this happened, that it was so not politically correct to suggest that technology went back for, uh, went back before the creation, that, that no self-respecting um, individual would, would be able to survive as a scholar. But even if that is the case, then why the, in this more secular age, um, has chronology not come back? Well, chronology hasn't come back now because it doesn't really have a 
much of a purpose. It does exist in evangelical circles. Um, you know, if you go onto the web, you can find lots of people doing very traditional chronology. Um, let me recommend my favorite website, raptureready.com, um, which actually computes every day's rapture index, which is the index of likelihood that the rapture is about to take place using a multifactorial analysis. Uh, it's, it's, it's an extremely interesting site. And on sites like that, you do see efforts to, say, take the events of recent history and fit them to the book of Daniel and to the book of Revelations. So in that sense, chronology goes on. The real problem is we've kind of solved it. There's not much more we can do with the data we have until someone finds something else. You know, Thales supposedly predicted an eclipse, but there's no eclipse that really works. There's nothing more you can say except that you know if he did if he did predict an eclipse his chronology is wrong um, if if he, otherwise he predicted something else supposedly an eclipse accompanied Xerxes's movement of his army across into Greece but there's no there was no eclipse that fits well since the 16th century people have only been able to say there was an eclipse before and there was an eclipse after but there was no eclipse when he moved. So that, that's why I think chronology is never really going to flourish. We can only work at the very detailed level of contracts from Hellenistic Egypt, which have particular dates, and there you can still find out new things. But yeah, it really was politically so incorrect to say that anything happened before the creation. Um, Scaliger's closest friend in some ways was Isaac Kasaubin, though they never met. They sent each other long letters week after week for 30 years. And Kasaubin gets his copy of this big book and he's reading along saying, gosh, Scaliger is smart. My goodness, this man knows a lot. And he comes to the Egyptian chronology and writes this, I don't see why we would trust these infidels for these figments of their obvious imagination. And though he mentions lots of things in his letters to Scaliger, he doesn't even mention this. It's as if Scaliger has done something unseemly in public even to publish this. In the middle of the 17th century, when Isaac La Perere is the first writer really to bring this stuff out in the open, writes this little book arguing that the Bible is, is basically has two creation stories. There's the creation at the beginning, that's the creation of the human race, and then there's a second one. There are really two creation stories. The second one is the creation of the Jews, and so there's no problem with Egypt. That's just what happened between the creation of the human race as a whole and the, the origin of the Jews. He is obliterated with 30 or 40 book length refutations, put under house arrest, and really treated as if he's done something criminal. So yeah, it really, um, it's not a more secular period. This is the, the fascinating thing. The 17th century is, from the standpoint of learning, an age of increasing pressure from the Bible, increasing literalism, increasing difficulty for dissent. It makes one respect the people like Hobbes who really live outside that all the more for their extraordinary independence of mind. In fact, uh, you raised another, in fact, you just raised another uh, issue, which is a really good question, I think, that these ancient Christian chronographers, Eusebius, Bruce, et al., uh, one of the reasons they were doing their chronologies was so they could project the parousia, the end of the world. Uh, do you see any of that uh, in, say, the 60s and 70s? Oh, sure. All the, anybody who gives you a Daniel statue is offering you some kind of guess as when, of the, when the end of the world is going to come. Eusebius actually didn't do that. He wanted you to believe that history was providential and that Constantine's adopting of Christianity marked the, the culmination of world history, but he refused to give any guess as to the parousia. And most learned chronologers say that, that you simply can't, you know, can't tell, as Augustine had told them you couldn't long before. Yeah. Geology certainly shoves out the beginning of time by millions of years, but that's only starting in the 17th century with Nicolaus Steno's observations about fossils. Um, you know, there had been observations in antiquity that evidently parts of the world had been covered with water that weren't now, but that actually seemed to verify the story of the flood. 
And so in my period, nobody really uses geology as that kind, of a, that kind of a tool. Insofar as they pay attention to geological evidence, it seems to confirm the basic biblical history of the world. Well, I think we'd love to continue this conversation outside at our reception. And then there's another shot uh, at uh, Grafton tomorrow at 5 o'clock in the Plym Auditorium <laughs> in Temple Buell Hall, where we'll be having a very informal conversation with a round table group titled Why History Matters. Please join me again in thanking Professor Grafton.